line of reasoning there. What was your thought process on that one? Uh, my thought, it was just a bunch of questions. I, I just, and I, I'm just so, in, I was saying just how opaque uh, politics are in the decision-making process. You know, like we know what the decision was to vote present, which I'm not even sure what the point in that was. I mean, they had the quorum. So she so didn't have a no vote on her record for some APAC type stuff, you know. <sighs> it's New York, dude. Yeah. It is New York. It is New York. At the end of the day, so, I mean, you kind of have to trust them to do the right thing, unfortunately. Yeah. I, and it, I mean, that, it's pretty exciting, I think, to, to potentially see a progressive as the next Speaker of the House. That's a pretty big deal, man. Yeah. I wonder are, if you get to be Speaker, are you progressive? You know, Nancy Pelosi was once a lot more progressive than she is now. She was. She was kind of, I don't know if she you was considered like the AOC. Fascist, dude. You have to negotiate with them and you'll never get nothing accomplished in there. You have to. I, I, I'm i completely with you. Yes, you do. Uh, Unfortunately. But it seems, like, it seems like there's not, Nancy Pelosi went from being a, probably not like an AOC left winger, but certainly she was more left wing than she is now. So are her current positions a result of her negotiating or... Has something happened? Pretty Has she been exposed to information? Man. Okay, all right. Because at the end of the day, you can only push for what is possible, you know? Mm. All, that's all they can do is push around the edges, man. Who would? Who else would you rather have a speaker in the entire house, you know? Anybody? I, I, I think she'd be great. I, th I mean, I, I don't really know she's a freshman congresswoman, um, you know, she wrote from what I'm a co-authored it and that is the yeah. progressive legislation for the next decade yeah there's a lot of great stuff and there. there's a lot of silly uh identity politics stuff in there too but the, uh, all the actual green new deal stuff well, uh, the, the new deal, deal stuff no, it's not actually yeah the new deal sure uh, the the new deal stuff and the green stuff i absolutely love and i'm, I'm in right. favor of it so i'll just you know and I'm just quibbling around the edges, around the dumb stuff. So that, that's not matter anyways. It's just you call me Zer if I want to be called Zer. You understand me? Sure. I'd be going in jail, Tony. Oh, no. We're not <laughs> Canada, are we? <laughs> I wanted to talk about the Wheel of Time TV show. This is extremely exciting to me because <laughs> I'm a Wheel of Time nerd. Mm -hmm. Sure, you don't care, but I will require you to watch this TV show. It's going to be better than Game of Thrones. Did you watch Game of Thrones? Did I watch Game of Thrones? You did? I got, actually, the book that I used to have sitting back here was the world book. It's kind of the Silmarillion for the Game of Thrones, or the Song of Ice and Fire world. So you, it's like the book you own, but you don't actually read. Uh, it's one of the few books that I did read. Most of my books are just for show. <laughs> I see. I, <laughs> The Game of Thrones books were good, but the Wheel of Time books were better, as a matter of fact. Yeah, yeah. so you had these books uh, when you were younger, right? I had most of the I'm, series. I'm, okay, I, I, that's how I was introduced to them, was through you. I don't, I never read them, um, but I, I'd always heard it's a great fantasy series, and I, I do love me some fantasy. So, it's 14 and, uh, books. I got my wife into it, and she finished the whole series in like two weeks, dude. 14 big-ass books. <laughs> Robert Jordan died before he finished the series. That's what's so iconic about it. Like, he died, and then his son and somebody else had to, like, co-author the final book. And they did a great job to tie, tie the bow on the series and stuff. But just excellent, excellent series. I don't know if they're going to do any good with – I mean, this cast is a little questionable. I don't know. Randall Thor it looks like a teeny bobber kid, dude. He's like some model. Okay, picture, all right. So This picture here doesn't look that bad. No, hang on, hang on. I've been working on this theory for a lot of years. Trailer, um, on your own time, I'll get copyright strike for it. But here's Randall Thorne, yeah. this guy, Josh Stradowski. So this right here, I, I've, been working, I've been working on this theory for a long time, that there is an inverse relationship between the attractiveness of the cast of any show and the quality of the writer. So if you, ha if you make a show... And all of your characters are beautiful young models. It's hiding the fact that your your writing and your plot is crap. 
If you get it with, you know, you can have beautiful people in there, but well, you can't Rose have. Rosalind Pike here from Moraine. She's a good actress, and she's older, and they have her. Yeah, she's she's, old, she's so good. It's going to be kind of centered around her story. Um, and they've only got eight. They have eight episodes planned, and they're going to do an additional eight. They've already they've already well, um, agreed to a second season. This is going to be on Amazon Prime. Well, certainly Amazon has the money, uh, and I I think that. Anybody attempting to do an epic uh, fantasy series nowadays is well aware of what happened with Game of Thrones. You, you would know, Game think of Thrones so started off. So. God, they can't fucking. You would hope so. Family. Yeah. It, I mean, the, the first four seasons of Game of Thrones, and I could go on. Or this this is opening up a door we might not want to open. <laughs> I could go on about this for a while, but the first four seasons of Game of Thrones were some of the best television. Uh, I the think best that's television ever been I've seen, um, probably. It's. Yeah, uh, season five started getting goofy, but it was redeemable. Season six was a uh, crap, except for the Battle of the Bastards. Season seven and eight were just don't say that, dude. Just, the Battle of the Bastards was so epic; it doesn't matter. That's what I'm epic. saying. That's, it was no, so epic. yeah. So that's season six was crap, except for the Battle of the Bastards. Right, but you the Battle of the Bastards was you don't call something crap that has the Battle of the Bastards contained within it, sir. <sighs> Have you ever seen men smushed with fucking tower shields before like that? No, that's one of the best battle scenes of all time. It might be... It's there top might... Top I, like, top all right, all right. So, all right, hang on. I'm gonna, what, Best three fantasy battle scenes of all time. Uh, battle of the Bastards. The Ride of the Rohirrim. You know, on Pelennor Fields, where they come up and he gives a speech, Ride for Ruin and for the World's Ending! It's not as and, good, uh, it's not as serious. It's more, like, um, campy, you know? Yeah, well, it's, it's a lot more, it's high fantasy as opposed sure. to the... You could put it that way. Whatever the Game of Thrones is, so... It's not uh, the same league as, like, Braveheart or, like, Battle of the Bastards type fight scenes, man. Hmm. I don't think. Yeah. But, um... Braveheart's good for its time. The last season was such a disappointment, though. It's so bad. I so bad. I don't bad. want to talk about it. Let's keep it moving. I don't Let's either. This is pre <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, if you are interested in new tropics, check out my website. Our line of cutting edge products is available at our lowest prices of the year. And we are still running free shipping, so get it while it lasts, guys. Free priority shipping. Uh, while supplies last, check it out. MetamaxPerformance.com. Shire Hemp Farms, your number one supplier for CBD, hemp, and Delta 8 products. We have youth products in right now, like CBD or Delta 8 dab syringes. We have new American made vape carts in. And we are extending that. We are extending the sale on uh, most products. Uh, use the code ESPOD checkout to get 20% off. Uh, support it. Thank you. Some stuff I just take for granted. I feel like people should know this stuff and they just don't because it's not really taught in school and it's not really discussed honestly by any anyone in public discourse, to be honest with you. Um, so, you know, I, I sort of associate myself with the anarchist movement. <laughs> The political philosophies of people like Bakunin, Kropotkin, you know, Emma Goldman, people like that. It's a long tradition. Um, it started about the same time, uh, really attributed to Bakunin um, initially. Mm -hmm. You could say Proudhon, but Bakunin was really the initiator. He, he, was, he got into some arguments with Marx about the way to do stuff, and it sort of created this whole movement. Um, and that really, that was the Spanish Revolution, 1936, was sort of based around that. So set me straight on this. Proudhon, he was... He was the the intellectual framework that that kind of introduced the concepts, and then uh, Bakunin. Uh, I'm terrible with these names. Bakunin was the one that went out and started actually uh, uh, organizing and really kind of nailing down the the ideology behind the anarchist movement. He was the one that went around different places in Europe. He was uh, uh, setting up all these different. Anarchist organizations uh, exactly. got sentenced. He got sentenced to most of the. He he spent time in most of the major prisons in Europe, and had multiple death sentences from multiple countries by the time he was finally caught and killed. I believe. 
let's define the major terms before we move any further so people understand what we're talking about. And let me put let me put it to you this way, guys. If you're arguing with somebody and they don't acknowledge or understand the definitions of these terms, um, they, they probably don't know what the hell they're talking about. So first of all, let's talk about um, socialism. What is socialism? General definition. Socialism uh, means basically that you believe in society. You want to share the resources of society in some sort of way. And there are very various gradations of that. And um, a lot of people throughout history have associated themselves with socialism. And really, everyone is a socialist. If you believe in society, you're a socialist. If you believe in the post office or the military, you're a socialist. I hate to tell you guys. The only pure, cap pure, pure capitalism doesn't exist. In fact, socialism is a result of capitalism. That was the beginning of yeah. sort of Marx. Marx's, Marx's whole point was, hey, capitalism is great and all, but we can do better. We can do better. And that was socialism. Well, I was just going to say, I know uh, kind of a more uh, uh, lay definition is you know, the means of production, control, exchange, being controlled by the community as a whole as opposed to individuals. Uh, that is sort of the Marxist it, uh, definition, yeah. Yeah. And, and it's also – so I, I actually – listen to a few things in anticipation for this. And uh, uh, it's also interesting, just from a historical perspective, how the definitions kind of changed over time. So sure. if you go back uh, in the Communist Manifesto, um, and a lot of Marx's writings, he actually uses communism and socialism almost interchangeably. Um, well, sure. And then they kind of diverge over time. I think you and I would use them. We would recognize them as two distinct uh School well, not necessarily. Style, but... if, you're thinking, if you're thinking purely in the Marxist sense, then communism mm -hmm. is the end goal of any socialist ac activity. You want to get sure. to communism. Anyone who talks about communism and tries to portray it as something it's not, be very skeptical, guys. Communism, just replace the word communism in your mind with the word utopia, because that's exactly what it is. Every socialist is a communist. Every, everyone is a communist because they want utopia. Communism is this idea that we're going to get to this great state where uh, there's no problems, you know, everything's communally owned and taken care of uh, as a group. But, you know, that's never really happened. It's an ongoing process, guys. So just w when people say communism um, and they're in the left, what they mean is utopia, right? And socialism, um, in the Marxist sense, is the, is the path toward to get to communism. Now, the problem with just looking at things through the communist lens of a Marxist is you're leaving out an entire school of thought, and that's anarchism. That's libertarian socialism. That's Bakunin. Socialism in this context is exactly what you said. It's the workers owning the means of production. But, but the main goal of anarchism is democracy. And Marx didn't necessarily believe democracy was the way to go, at least it, not in the Marxist-Leninist, Trotskyist yeah. sense. Marx himself yeah, so was a democratic-minded uh, person, but the people who came after him necessarily weren't, um, in particular countries like you know Soviet Russia, not exactly democratic. Yeah, the uh, so I think this is kind of when the two diverged, right? I guess right after Marx, and you had the libertarian socialists, which would be the anarchists, and then uh, kind of Marx's school, the communists, were known as the author authoritarian socialists. And apparently, like I said, I, I just kind of re researched some of this stuff. Authoritarian socialists did not have the same negative connotation that we would kind of view it with today. It just it just meant that things weren't really run at the same communal level that, that the anarchists would uh, would want to, want to run things at. You know, you have the, the dictatorship of the proletariat, for example. Right. Well, you had different types of Marxist thinkers at the time, right? You had Lenin, you had Trotsky, you had Mao, and then you had others. You had anarcho-communists. You had people that mm -hmm. believed in democracy that read Marx and interpreted Marx. Marx can be interpreted a lot of different ways. Mm -hmm. Marx is, is really just a critique of capitalism, um, and there's... You know, you can the way you can take dictatorship of the proletariat is you can you can take that to be a democratic, grassroots, uh, uh, syndicalist uh, type of organization. You know, organized from the bottom up in a democratic fashion. You can call that whatever you want to call it, but that's um, that's anarcho syndicalism, and that's mm -hmm. under the our Marxist school of thought. All types of socialism originated really with Marx, in the modern sense. And the reason uh, you can't just say um, socialism is a Marxist thing is because we have a new type of sort of socialism, democratic socialism these days is what we mostly talk about. These are countries like, you know, Norway, Finland, Sweden, and so on. It's also the United States. It's also France. It's also Venezuela. 
even though they, they're labeled as Marxist-Leninists. They were democratic socialists um, under Hugo Chavez. So let's get into some granular uh, discussion here. Pierre-Joseph Proudhon, this was the French Revolution. He was the first official anarchist. And he originated the, the, the concept that property is theft. And this is what I always harp on. Property is indeed theft. Um, you are stealing it from everyone else who can't have access to it, for one. For two, the lineage of all owned property goes back to theft and murder. I mean, there's really no direct lineage of honestly accrued property in the modern world whatsoever. And he was completely right about that. And really, property rights are sort of the basis of capitalism. And when you realize it's all theft, it sort of makes sense. This is the most flattering picture I could find of Proudhon here. <laughs> he looks like uh, quite the intellectual. He was, he was a hefty guy, but they got him. And in his writings, in his famous sort of essay about uh, property being theft, he did make clear that he was referring to property in, the term, in terms of land, not necessarily labor-made wealth. Um, Land was the main thing, but, you know, obviously resources, this, the air, every, every sort of naturally occurring thing that we somehow own. And he, he in fact, favored workers' councils or co cooperatives, yeah. not um, nationalization in terms of state-run uh, bureaucracy, the way the uh, Marxist-Leninists wanted to do it yeah. at the time. Yeah, also, uh, so he was from Eastern... Where was he from? He, he was Eastern Europe, right? Uh, I'm not sure. Or no, he, he, oh, he, he was, was French. Oh, okay. Uh, I, was, I was thinking he'd come from there and then went to France. Okay. Uh, but yeah, I think it's all just historical context at the time. Uh, all the land was owned by the aristocracy. So it's not... Well, the French Revolution, you know, you know the, the peasants were starving. And here comes Pierre Proudhon saying, all this property is yeah. your guys' is too, yeah. man. Yeah, yeah, Maybe there wasn't, right. you know, <laughs> there, there weren't like, it's not like, you know, most places today or here in America, most of Europe where individuals could own property. You could, you were owning a, a smaller subset of it, but uh, yeah, at, at that time, no, one. it was just aristocracy, people that had just come there at a certain point. This was my father's land and his before him, and we conquered it by, by blood. And, and, and so like the... I guess the the delineation, the distinction between the the poor and the landowners was much more uh, a lot clearer back then. So well, that, that's the kind of what his reaction was to. Yeah, this was the late 1800s. This wasn't that far away from the enclosure movement in Europe, where basically all of the communal lands were fenced in by the lords, and all the peasants were driven off the land. So they 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 had to go work for these for these lords, because originally these forests uh, were all communal property, you know. This was the enclosure movement. This is sort of a result of that. I mean, there were stories of the peasants being mm. – oh, the only food they were given was was moldy bread, and then the, the, the royalty would keep all the unmoldy bread. It's like, how long is that going to be sustainable, you know? <laughs> Not very long, as it turned out. <laughs> Mikhail Bakunin, that was Proudhon's student. He's the father of modern anarchism. Uh, he and Marx were rivals, obviously. They wrote at the same time, had a lot of disagreements. Neither one were perfect. Either you can go back to the record and find things that they were wrong about, obviously. But um, Bakunin, he headed the anarchist faction of the IWA, the International Workers Association, and argued for self-governing workplaces and communes to bring about socialism, not the state, as Marx argued for. He predicted, all the way back then, that Marxist re regimes would be one-party dictatorships over the proletariat, not by the proletariat. Very prescient. This is exactly what happened. There are a, a lot of thinkers we could go into. Um, I want to talk about Chomsky. Obviously, he's the most important. You can talk about Emma Goldman. She's also very important. In the 1930s, the uh, workers' movement in this country had a lot of anarchists. That was what the Haymarket Massacre was. It was, it was um, scapegoating the anarchist movement in the United States. And they hanged, uh, I think, 11 of them. Yeah. The New York Times called him called him arguably the most important intellectual alive today, even though they refused to ever have him on or feature any of his writings because he was such a sharp critic of the United States and their policies. And he was famous for um, this uh, statement, all hierarchies are unjust by their nature and should be dismantled unless they can prove their necessity. This was his 
the, the philosophical basis for his type of anarchism. Um, there are people running around who call themselves Chomskyists um, these days. It's it's just uh, I like to always point out that you know here in the U.S. nobody knows who Chomsky is. Very few people know who Chomsky is. Um, you don't hear him being quoted in any magazines, uh, media outlets, stuff like that. He is the eighth most cited uh, literary source in history. Uh, in the social science uh, social science citation index. Uh, likely the greatest number of times for a living person there as well. He was cited 7,400 times. Um, yeah, it's like on, the, the eighth most eighth most overall. He's been on one mainstream sort of TV show in the U.S. that I remember, and he totally eviscerated this um, CIA guy talking about Nicaragua, the Contra scandal, completely eviscerated him, and that was the last time he was ever on U.S. TV. He was on Buckley's show that one time. And other than that, he's been on book TV a couple times in the last few decades. But, yeah, other than that, no media exposure whatsoever. Completely blackballed. But, in fact, NPR even refused to have Chomsky on at one point. He is the founder of modern linguistic theory. He invented natural language. His great contribution to the theory, to the field of linguistics. Because until this point, we thought that language was just something that sort of kids figured out. There was no basis for it. But in fact, that's not the case. As soon as you look more deeply, you find that these languages are basically molded to a pretty similar design, maybe an identical design. The large parts of, the of what we hear is just the sounds. But that's a very superficial part of language. Uh, the core of language is... Uh, principles that determine uh, actually an infinite array of possible expressions, structured expressions, which have definite meanings. Now, all of that is well beyond what we can just observe by, say, looking at uh, texts. And when a child is learning a language, the child doesn't learn those things. There's no evidence for them, almost no evidence for them. Uh, nobody can teach them. We don't even know what they are. These are just part of our nature. So the, he he sort of realized this and popularized it. Um, it seems like human beings evolved this natural language, and then other other the, the languages we speak come out of that. <laughs> and a lot of people nowadays associate the development of natural language with the huge leap in evolution that happened with humans. It was because of our ability to use language to store information over time and to uh, uh, compound that knowledge over time that really allowed us to advance as, as a species. And it would make sense too, you know, it, early human, it, it's the same, it would make sense that it was the same uh, change to our brain function that it was affected to, you know, through all of our predecessors that uh, allowed the development of language. So, you know, I don't, I don't know why it would have been thought different prior to Chomsky, but it seems pretty natural to well, assume Chomsky that, really. realized, you have to realize Chomsky's really old. This was a long time ago, first of all. <laughs> Chomsky realized that all these languages, because he speaks like eight languages, he realized all these languages have the same basic parts, it's just where you put them kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Nobody figured it out until Chomsky. He was, the, he was the one, man. Chomsky is very unique, and he's it's so important to the movement. It's such a shame that he's so old now. He reads, when he was younger, he read literally everything, every journal, everything. And he remembered it all word for word. That's what made him so dangerous to the, to the ruling class. Um, there are just dozens and dozens of clips I could play to, to, to point this out. Here's one where Buckley, I don't know if you know William F. Buckley here. He's a famous conservative friend of, like, Rumsfeld and Wolfowitz, that sort of group. Uh, even if we all agree that what we did in Dresden was inexcusable, uh, uh, as a moral question, it's got to be understood in context of what was it that brought us mm -hmm. to Dresden in the first instance. Absolutely. And yeah. what brought us to South Vietnam in the first instance, uh, in my judgment, was clearly uh, a, an uninterested, or I should say disinterested, uh, concern for the uh, uh, stability and possibilities of a region of the world. What, uh, to which what we were period, about about what period do you feel that we had this disinterest? 
So Buckley here is arguing that the United States' role in Vietnam was a disinterested party. We bombed, we invaded, but we weren't that interested. Yeah. Good relationship to Vietnam. Well, right now. No, at what period did we have it? Did it begin? Let's say 1951, for example, when, well, we, when the State Department bulletin points out that we must help the French uh, <clears throat> reconquer their uh, former colony and we must eradicate all Vietnamese resistance down to its last roots in order well, to reestablish the French in power. Wished, was that yeah, to, to increase my vulnerability, I wish we had uh, helped the French. We did. We, we, we supported but not them. But sufficiently. Well, but there's no point in helping but, somebody. But hard, it's hardly, it was hardly disinterested when we attempted as, you know, with, with tremendous uh, uh, support, in fact, to reinstate French imperialism in South Vietnam. Now, it was disinterested in this sense, and, and I think this is an important distinction which you do touch on your book. It's a disinterested act uh, if of my attempt to help or your attempt to help a particular nation is in order to spare you the possibility of a great ordeal in the future mm. uh, which will harm you, your family, your children, oh, yes, your public. And in that now, sense, not, uh, Nazi now, Germany was also disinterested. Yeah, in, so after all, Nazi Germany was conquering Eastern yeah, Europe right. only in order to advance the so, uh, values of sure. Christian spiritual civilization and to no, no, restore no, 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 the Slavs no, 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 to their no, no, rightful well, home and so on and so forth. Uh, and he eviscerates Buckley, of course he does. At one point, let's see here, Buckley threatens to punch him in the face. Kind of well, issue where well. you know, sometimes I lose my temper. Maybe not tonight. Maybe not tonight. <laughs> uh, because uh, if you would, I'd smash him in the goddamn face. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the, you say, you say. God! Oh, this is the condescension and to arrogance. Howard Zinn. So Chomsky has been the most prominent critic of U.S. foreign policy in the past 50 years. That is, that is his most important um, contribution to modern society. He really chronicled all this stuff. Like I said, he had a, a photographic memory. He remembered everything, man. Traditionally, the U.S. and Britain have been supporting radical Islam throughout the region. I mean, there are good reasons for that. Uh, and they continue to. The reasons are to, um, you can tell it from the internal documents, British and American internal documents, uh, the reason is a, kind of a rational analysis. Uh, the real threat, they say, is the virus of secular nationalism. That's dangerous. Uh, secular nationalism, say like Nasser, for example, uh, can lead to the possibility of uh, uh, efforts to try to take the resources of the region and use them for their own populations uh, rather than for the benefit of the West and uh, uh, the ruling, uh, super rich ruling families. These are all good. If you, if you guys want to check out Chomsky's work, I highly recommend his um, talks because his talks are verbatim from his books. Um, so the, the books that there are not audiobook versions of, you can find a lot of them on the Anarchist Library, um, but his talks are verbatim from his books also. Chomsky is a leading critic of U.S. intellectualism. So people like Sam Harris, Christopher Hitchens. I think that they are religious fanatics. They happen to believe in the state religion, which is much more dangerous than uh, other religions for the most part. So they, uh, uh, both of them, happen to be defenders of the state religion, uh, namely the religion that says uh, we have to support the uh, violence and atrocities of our own state because it's being done for all sorts of wonderful reasons, which is exactly what everyone says in every state. And I, I don't regard, that's just another religion, like the religion that markets know best. I mean, it doesn't happen to be a religion that you pray to every um, once a week, but it's just another religion, and it's very destructive. That's him criticizing Hitchens and Harris's take on U.S. interventionism in the Middle East. Can't get them all right. <laughs> <clears throat> and I have, uh, this is uh, something to do with his critique of U.S. policy in Israel. And the obstacles to a resolution uh, are also quite clear. The basic outlines were presented here in a resolution brought to the U.N. Security Council in January 1976. It called for a two-state settlement on the internationally recognized border, and now I'm quoting, with guarantees for the rights of both states to exist in peace and security within secure and recognized borders. 
Uh, the resolution was brought by the three major Arab states, uh, Egypt, Jordan, Syria, sometimes called the confrontation states. Uh, Israel refused to attend the session. The resolution was vetoed by the United States. Uh, a U.S. veto typically is a double veto. Uh, the veto, the uh, resolution is not implemented, and the event is vetoed from history. So you have to look hard to Classic find Chomsky the record, line there. but it is there. U.S. vetoes are double vetoes. Mm. You veto the resolution, and then it's vetoed from history at the same time. It's crazy. That was Chomsky in 2011, I think, at the U.N., the U.S., I should point out here, has been vetoing every resolution that would do anything to limit Israeli aggression in the occupied territories, including votes almost every year for a two-state solution on the internationally recognized border. This isn't televised or published in U.S. media for some strange reason. Can you wonder? I wonder why that is. Maybe because the mainstream media in the United States is just a wing of the government at this point, essentially. Mm -hmm. Um, Chomsky also um, has a lot of work on uh, the political science stuff. He has a, his, his most famous book is probably on anarchism, um, for, for as far as that goes. I know you can find that on the Anarch Anarchist Library. Uh, uh, looked at uh, in these terms, anarchism is a tendency in human development that seeks to identify structures of hierarchy, domination, authority, uh, and uh, others that constrain human development. And then it seeks to subject them to a very reasonable uh, challenge. Justify yourself, demonstrate that you're legitimate, and maybe in some special circumstances or conceivably in principle. Uh, and if you can't meet that, uh, that challenge, which is the usual case, the structure should be dismantled. And as Nathan rightly adds, not just dismantled, but reconstructed from below. Uh, the ideals that found expression during the Enlightenment and the Romantic era, uh, they foundered on the shoals of rising industrial capitalism, which is completely antithetical to them. But uh, Rocker argues, I think quite plausibly, that they remain alive in the libertarian socialist traditions. These range pretty widely. They range from uh, left anti-Bolshevik Marxism, that's people like uh, Anton Panikuk, uh, Karl Korsch, Paul Maddock, and others, including the anarcho-syndicalism that uh, reached its peak of achievement in the uh, revolutionary period in Spain in 1936, and it's well... A little dry, but like I said, it's literally word for word from his book. He... He's not reading anything either here, guys. He's just literally, he has his book memorized. Yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing listening it's to remarkable. him speak, uh, especially if in conversation with someone or in debate with someone, uh, his ability for recall and not just he to remember something things. somebody said, but all, all sorts of context. This memo was written at this point in time from this person to this person. This was at the very least, yeah, his, his recall is just astounding, and he, he really is just a wealth of information. Uh, Could you imagine if they concerning the subject he talks about debate like like anyone? Not now. Yeah, I, mean, I mean, but it just yeah. Current media, it's just not set up for uh, and just let him go. A long, dry speaker like that, you know, there's nothing sensationalist, and uh, I'm sure he, Chomsky could have plenty of hot takes, but he would say them in the driest way imaginable, and. Uh, Dude, he had some hot takes not too long ago on the he, he always has internet media. He had a great interview recently with uh, Crystal and Kyle. Oh, really? uh, yeah, yeah. It was, he's like what ninety three years old now. Um, gave this great interview and just at the end of it, just it, it was a mic drop moment. They they asked him a question. You know, how do you want to be remembered in in this struggle? You know, you're ninety three. You you. Uh, you're such a big hero to the to the left in this country. Um, you know, how do you want us to remember your contribution to this cause? And he just goes, I don't care what you think about me. He's like, I don't care. It was just, you know, I, I, he's like, I don't care if you remember me. It doesn't matter. He's like, whatever. Uh, yeah, it, it was perfect. He's a little, he speaks slower, but he's still all there, man. 
what a remarkable human. He's really not, bit, there's nobody to really replace him, unfortunately. So let's go through the yeah. little bit of the history of the anarchist successes and examples. Um, uh, let's start off with the Paris Commune, though. This was the first. This was 18, I think, 98. I could be wrong about that. And the Prussians promptly surrounded the capital city of Paris and asked for Elsa and Lorraine plus a lot of money in exchange for peace. The government declared that they would not give up an inch of territory to the Prussian invader. The Prussians dug trenches around Paris and decided to wait until the French would give up. Weeks turned into months and nothing much happened besides the fact that the food and coal supply... I don't know if you can understand what he's saying here, but this is... Uh, Paris is surrounded by the Prussian army at this point, and they're negotiating some sort of settlement. ...and the city got lower. At the time, there were 50,000 professional soldiers and 120,000 recruits who were loyal to the government in Paris, and around 300,000 men from the National Guard. After some more starving and suffering, there was a proposal for an armistice with the Germans. The condition was that the French army had to give up their arms. The National Guard was exempt from this because the government argued that they needed them to keep order in the city. Now, the National Guard was mostly made up of civilians and they were organized by the districts they were from. They mostly reflected the opinions of the workers of Paris and the surrounding provinces, which was inspired by socialist and anarchist writing. They weren't exactly disciplined and even demanded to elect their own officers and sometimes refused to follow orders unless they had democratically decided if they were okay with the order. Can you imagine that? Democracy in the army. After the climate became more heated and the government and the National Guard fought about the few guns, the government left the city. This means that the workers were now somehow in control of the city. So eventually Paris was surrounded by the Germans and eventually the, the French government just left them to die basically. And the French were like, well, <laughs> what are we going to do? <laughs> the national government, as well as the local government, including the mayor, had left. Suddenly, everything the workers dreamed of could be achieved. They could create a new government based on the socialist and anarchist ideas they had read about. All that change was suddenly possible. They created a council to govern the commune and immediately held elections. The council was made up of representatives that represented about 20,000 citizens each. They could immediately called back by the voters if they backed something the people didn't agree with. The council also had some professions represented in it. For example, they had 33 industrial workers, 5 small business owners, 19 clerks and other big professions taking part in the voting in the meeting. This was to ensure that the laws they made wouldn't hurt the workers of Paris. They officially proclaimed the commune, they held a big parade and started to implement their changes. They changed the flag to a plain red banner and switched the calendar back to the disastrous thing they tried during the French Revolution a few decades earlier. The council was made up of different factions. There were the radicals that wanted to implement changes that would help the people and there were the moderates that didn't want to do that and argued that a better world isn't possible. This will be familiar to anyone who has ever seen any political debate. The radicals were made up of both anarchists and socialists who were happy to work together at this time. Because the anarchists uh, proposed it, they decided to not have a president, mayor or commander-in-chief. You know, anarchism, rule without a leader. Those jobs were to be done by democratically elected committees instead. Oh, and when I mean democratically elected, I mean every man over 20. In the six times they met, they agreed on some nice changes, for example. The abolition of capital punishment, the abolition of military conscription, the separation of church and state, the remission of rents owed for the entire period of the siege, the abolition of child labor and night work in bakeries, the granting of pensions to the unmarried companions of children of National Guardsmen who gave their life in active service. This was new since until then only married people got the pensions. The free return by pawn shops of all workmen's tools and household items valued up to 20 francs pledged during the siege, the postponement of commercial debt obligations and the abolition of interest on debts. The right of the workers to take over and run an enterprise if it were deserted by its owner. The prohibition of fines imposed by employers on the workmen. In addition to that, they seized church land and made it public. Pretty good. The whole democracy thing, I don't know, sounds scary. Yeah, it, it, the, the fact that this was just itself organized. I mean, uh, the, the... Well, it wasn't so... It didn't automatically happen. People had to work at it, you know? Well, yeah, but it... They didn't go into it 
intent with this it, it come about organically over right. what the course of a exactly. couple months that's that's how what societies I'm saying. naturally organize themselves yeah. when given the opportunity chomsky's written about this um, prudon written wrote about this yeah so you have the the right conditions you know the the workers of paris at the time were just I mean, they're in one step up from slaves at that point. They, but the, all the facts prior to that they were they they were taxed into oblivion they were one step above slaves or yeah living in squalor, uh, horrible conditions, and they were starting to be radicalized. This is when the, the, the labor movements were really gaining a lot of traction. You, you had all these different organizations popping up, and then the government abandons them, and, and they really... It would be interesting to see where it went if it lasted for a few years. You know, how, much, how many of these things, uh, how much further they would have went, how many of the things they would end up repealing, you know, would somebody have ended up taking power? Would there have been a council? I, I just, the you play the what if game all day so, long. They're so scary to the, to the, to the fascists and the capitalists in Europe at the time that they just get crushed instantaneously. Like what happened in Spain, you know, I have a clip for uh Spanish revolution as well. This is 1936. This is the height of the workers movement in the United States. This is the one sort of always referenced. Barter, not purchasing, kept Barcelona fed for the first weeks of the Civil War. In some places, money itself, seen by anarchists as inherently evil, was abolished. Shopping was done with vouchers, issued by local committees. This was the sort of original concept of the labor voucher, an idea that's been bandied about quite a bit in the socialist circles in modern day. A sort of a far down the road idea, you know, but um now that the factories and workplaces were in the hands of the workers, anarchist union leaders like Josep Costa fought to start production again. We told the workers to get back to the factory and wait for our instructions. Immediately we called all the factory owners and executives to a meeting at the town hall. We tell them. Well, it's cool that they have all this footage. Like the people in Catalonia now can look at this stuff and say and see the recent past. You know. Yeah, and that lasted nine months, I believe. Well, it was crushed by a, a coalition of capitalists and fascists, the West, yeah. including the United States. Um, yeah, yeah, the U.S. Uh, to, uh, <laughs> the U.S. took a special interest in in making sure that it, uh, the Spanish government was funded and, and well supplied to take that out. I think there was a lot of fear, like you mentioned earlier, it was kind of the height of the workers' movement in the U.S. and can't. Can't let them see something like uh, what they're pushing for actually working somewhere. But uh, also, if you ever get a chance, Homage to Catalonia, which is written by George Orwell, Have is a fantastic. Been. Yeah, it's a, it, it's it's excellent. He actually went there. He was with the uh, the International Workers Brigade. Uh, he went there to fight in the Spanish Civil War, and you know he's a writer and he he documented everything. Let's talk about Mondragon. This is a worker co-op in Spain, the largest ever. The the current implementation of what modern day socialists um, talk about. Um, anyone who's not a tanky, we talk about market socialism. This in between. This is what we want. Um, this is how we get a broad coalition of the left uh, with people like democratic socialists, like Tony here. Um, we all want the same thing. The next step is the same for everyone. Um, no matter what your ideology, unless you're a fucking tanky and you want to burn the whole thing down, which if that's the case, you're an idiot. This is a worker co-op. So the workers own it and manage it democratically. This, these things take shape in an organizational structure, which we you know, could talk about for, for a few hours, but I won't do that. Um... I'll just point out that here, this part of the organization looks like almost any other. Right? You have uh, an organizational chart, certain hierarchy. There is hierarchy in Mondragon. 
almost no one in Mondragon is opposed to hierarchy. What they wonder is, how does the hierarchy work? Is it steep and rigid and bureaucratic and authoritarian? Or is it flat, open, transparent, participatory, communicative? Right? So there is hierarchy, no question about it. And at the bottom of that hierarchy, in a sense, are the, is the workforce. The men and women who, who do whatever jobs need to be done in that co-op. But the difference between this organizational chart and a conventional one is that these people at the quote unquote bottom are also at the quote on, uh, at the quote unquote top. So this is the same as a modern day corporation, except for the fact that instead of one share, one vote, instead of shareholders, it is owned by the workers. And every worker has a vote, including the janitor, including everybody who works for that company. And they vote democratically to elect uh, the CEO, see how he's in the middle here, and they decide what his pay is going to be. He doesn't decide their pay. This is democracy in action here. And there are um, criticisms you can make of Mondragon. They are not 100% co-op at this point. They are expanding globally. Um, but I think they're doing a better job than anybody else right now. Let's put it that way. Yeah, these little experiments and uh, real true worker co-ops, are, they're always just fascinating. How, well, this is not a little experiment. How they organize. This is a massive corporation. It's They have, hmm. they're all over the globe. Um, it's like the fifth largest company in Spain. Huh. Yeah, I, I hadn't heard of them, I think, until... You brought them up on a previous podcast. I really haven't looked into them. It's uh, that way. probably should. Ana de Castro is working shorter hours at the moment. The economic crisis has hit the Fagor company hard. De Castro has been fitting electric motors in refrigerators for the past 12 years. She's responsible for this part of the production process now. As a member of the cooperative, she also owns part of the company. All of the workers are part owners. We make the money, it's ours. It affects us all. If this wasn't a cooperative, then the company would have downsized and people would have been fired. Fagor hasn't fired anyone. And that in spite of how difficult it is currently to sell fridges in Spain, where the market has shrunk by 40% in the past three years. Production manager Jose Antonio Gonzalez and his co-workers have agreed on drastic cuts with management. At the end of the day, we don't owe anybody anything. We workers are lucky to be part owners. We are the people who have to decide what to do and how much to cut our wages, how much we have to sacrifice. That's how we'll get by. And one last clip on Mondragon. This is Noam Chomsky talking about Mondragon uh, over a decade ago, I believe. Oh, this is a long time ago. Like take, for example, one of the most uh, successful industrial commercial installations in, in Spain, quite big, in fact, Mondragon. It's a big collection of industrial works, uh, schools, um, you know, social systems, health systems, and so on. Very substantial, very successful. It's one of the few parts of the Spanish economy that's competitive internationally, even after joining uh, European Union, it's worker-owned, uh, and it's partially socialist anarchist. It's worker-owned, but manager-controlled. Workers pick the managers, but they theoretically at least control the managers. How much they control them, you can debate. Uh, and uh, it, it, but in, but the, there's no outside investors telling them what to do. They have their own banks. And it's expanded so much since even then, man. Pretty remarkable. And really, there's, there's nothing stopping this sort of thing from happening except the capital is not available for it to take place. The workers don't have the money to buy the companies. That's the problem because of these stupid property laws saying that all these rich guys own all these shares of Amazon and shit. Hmm. I'd be interested to hear what the holdup is. If the lack of co-op is going... 
if, it, if, if it's going to be profitable, if it's going to be able to pay back the loan with interest, what is the holdup? I don't think the bank has an ideological, maybe they do, maybe some people in the bank do, have an ideological opposition to the idea of a worker co-op. Well, each so, individual worker would have to join some sort of agreement to try to get a loan as a co-op. Yeah. That's, I, mean, that, that, I, I, I guess that would yeah, be the issue. You'd have to get a bunch of people together. You're, you're talking about are working for our company. infrastructure. Um, you know, you'd have to find a company that wants to sell first. I mean, oh, it, sure it has happened. I mean, in South America, there's there's mm -hmm. co-ops where the, the plants were just abandoned and the workers took them over because of neoliberal well, policies. But in the U.S., James, you, know, you would have to buy the company. Yeah, I've got an exciting announcement right now. What's that? I will hand over my company to the workers oh, shit. that work here, and it will be completely democratically run. Hitherto for. One man, one vote. Hitherto, hitherto for. One man, one vote. Literally and yeah, look, just just me. So, so what is the difference between democratic socialism, uh, what Bernie Sanders talks about, and libertarian socialism, what I talk about, which is anarchism? Uh, the U.S. itself has many socialist aspects, as all economies do, such as the post office, the military, fire department, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and in terms of the Marxian sort of definition, the workers have to have democratic control over the means of production in a legal sense. That is the, the difference in my mind between libertarian socialism, what I advocate for, and democratic socialism like France or uh, democratic socialists like Bernie Sanders advocate for is that is that property right. The right that, that the capitalist has to own that wealth um, that's created from that property. In my world, a law would be passed saying that the workers have to have to be given democratic control of that company above a certain size. Obviously, it's not really practical for someone like Tony yeah. to, uh, to start up a worker co-op over there. So it's not just high taxes. It is a constitutional right to the means of production should be under the control of the workers. Why? So that capitalists can't reassert control over the political structure slowly eroded over time as they have been doing in this country since the 1930s. Uh, we've looked before at the chart of top nominal tax rate over time. It is a straight line down from 1939 uh, to today. We are still in the era of the Trump tax cuts, the lowest taxes in history for the top 1% and large corporations. What constitutes the means of production? This can vary. For uh, anarchists, uh, for the most part, this means democratic ownership being given to, um, and the example I, I like to use uh, for like syndicalism or, I mean, they're all very similar, but uh, the way you can visual, visualize it is every company has to have a union. It's enforced by law. You have to have a union, and the union runs the company. Let's just put it that way. And the union has to be organized in a democratic way, obviously. Um, and the political system. Anarchists uh, who don't know what they're talking about will say no government, uh, just no leaders. That's not how it works. It is direct democracy principles written about by people like Proudhon, who we discussed earlier. Recall. This is the ability to remove a sitting uh, legislator from office at any time for any reason, like they tried to do to uh, Gavin Newsom. Recall. That's the idea. Say you elect uh, Bernie Sanders. Well, if Bernie Sanders does fuck, invades Guatemala, we should be able to recall him from office and elect somebody else. Referendum. This is the idea that everyone should get to vote on major policy issues. For example, in Texas, let the women vote and decide if they want to give up the right to an abortion. Don't just pass a law that says they can't have one anymore. And rotational or non-voluntary representation. This is the sort of organizational structure whereby, say, me and Tony run a company. Well, Tony's going to be the boss first this week, and then next week I'll be the boss. We just rotate it, and there's no election. That way everybody gets a shot. There's no, uh, uh, there's no accumulation of power at the top under some sort of demagogue leader. Everyone gets a chance to be the leader, and it just rotates. Now, when do these different types of organizational principles come into play? You know, whenever you want, what seems more democratic, let people decide. They're all valid, and they all can mm -hmm. be uh, implemented to make things better. 
um, syndicates. This is anarcho-syndicalism you may have heard about. This is basically what the Spanish Revolution in 1936 was. They have the best flag also, the, incidentally. Was it's it the, the red and black flag? Re, yeah, with the slash down the middle. That was uh, Spain. Uh, of all the different anarchist and communist groups, anarcho-syndicalists have the best flag. So what do you think about these ideas, Tony? Have I convinced you yet to come over to the black and red? I, I think there's a... There are a million practical details that would have to be worked out in a lot of those. And I'm sure somebody's done a lot of the uh, thinking that, that would need to be done to make them work. But uh, I think they're a great starting point, really. The, the, the principles on which these ideas are founded, I, I believe, are, are sound. And, uh, you know, as with anything, it just takes a lot, of, a lot of work and trial and error to figure out exactly what the right mix is for any of them. So you don't have any basic um, disagreement with the idea that things should be run democratically, sort of in general? No, of course not. Uh, I, I have just kind of pragmatic uh, sticking points with any of these things that, uh, you know, I guess natural apprehensions as to whether or not how well they would function and how practical they would be. I know um, you, at one point you brought up the whole California referendum thing, like, yeah, but you know, in my opinion, the argument I, I make to that is like California is probably the best state to freaking live in. To be honest with you, see my uncle recently. He he's lived in California for thirty years, and uh, him and both of his daughters, my cousins, are all leaving California. Now, he's not rich, but he's done well for himself. He's he's got plenty of money, so maybe it's just his perspective. I don't even know. I, I don't know the guy's political. Yeah, his money. He wants to get the hell out before they tax him. Maybe. I mean, he did buy a house in Fresno 30 years ago, so it's probably worth like $10 million now. He <laughs> sell it and come back to Kentucky and live like a king. Um, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I've got issues with the the idea of, of direct democracy on like a purely uh, majority rules. It just seems like uh, my my natural reaction to that is just it's, it's there's a lot of fuckery that could be uh, instituted in, in a system like that. You know, if, if we were doing direct democracy in the South during the 60s or 50s. Well, you know, they'd still have segregation. Sure. You know? um, well, the, 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 sort uh, of... the tyranny of the majority is what I, what I would worry right. about. And obviously, that's a common sort of uh, problem that people bring up. Um, I, I'm, everyone I've read uh, um, that, uh, argues for the creation of a Bill of Rights. I mean, it seems to be pretty important. Um, to societies, and really one of the great things that the United States has done is the Bill of Rights to uh, protect protect individual rights, you know, from the tyranny yeah. of the majority, like you say. Yeah, yeah. I'd be interested to go deeper into this as the weeks go by. We start nailing down some of these specific issues and, and uh, bringing up my apprehensions about it, and uh, I'm sure somebody's already put the thought into how to circumvent my apprehension, so. Let's talk about Marxism. What should we think about Marxism? Well, yes, I think it has an awful lot to offer us. Uh, to put it in context, you know, Marxism is a very complicated and rich body of, of understanding. It's been contributed to by every culture, every race, every community imaginable, advanced countries, underdeveloped countries. So it's a very complicated thing and lends itself, like all great things, to different interpretations. The Soviet Union, the People's Republic of China, and so on, they made one kind of interpretation. For them, the alternative to capitalism was the state being everything, taking control of the factories and the offices, running everything, planning everything. But there were always other Marxists who didn't see it that way. And it would be folly for us to interpret Marxism or to limit our understanding of Marxism to only one interpretation. To give you an idea of how silly that is, it would be as if I interpreted the Roman Catholic Church by looking at the Inquisition or Christianity by saying, gee, it was Christian folks who brought the slaves from Africa to the United States, or who fought each other in the most terrible war in human history, World War I. That would be silly and kind of childish. It would be an attempt to dismiss these things rather than deal with them seriously. I now, this is uh, Richard Wolff. He is a, an economist. He's a socialist economist. He's very... Uh He's written a lot on this subject. He's probably the best known and largest uh, sort of Marxist economist in the world. 
Um, so check him out, guys. I wanted to throw him in at the end here. Um, if you guys need a reading list or you're interested in these topics, I definitely recommend Richard Wolf. He goes into detail on the economic side if, that, if you're an economics nerd. Let's save the rest of this till uh, later in the week or next week. Okay. We'll discuss uh, tankies in a little more detail. Have you met any of these people? Marxist I don't Chinese think I have. Who oh, sort Mar of support like uh, uh, Mao and like Stalin. Now look, me and Tony, look, the thing, the reason that me and Tony agree on this shit and also agree with people like Bernie Sanders, we also agree with people like AOC, is because the next step is all the same for us. We all have a different end goal in mind maybe, but the next step is universal health care. It's always the same, but not for tankies, man. Tankies want to let it all burn down, get, go to shit, and then they want a violent revolution uh, yeah. 10 years down the line or something. It's just a terrible strategy. It's not going to work. It's stupid. Yeah. These, these are the, this is what I was saying earlier. These are, they're, they're LARPers. So I, I, was, uh, I was watching my videos, my YouTube videos, kind of in preparation for this about anarchism and just kind of listening to things. And then uh, comes up with this vice uh, the spice series about the modern day anarchists and these Antifa types, and they're like all gearing up and they're black and going out there about how we have to beat up. Not and they're emulating these kind of the anarchists. Antifa, of the Antifa is not are not tankies, right? I mean, are they? Well, they they were kind of they were doing a bunch of different people. So this is okay. kind of all parts of the same group. But the the, the ones they they were larpers. These these people that. They fetishize and idealize this idea. I'm going to tease this a little bit next week. We're going to get into some tanky talk. We're going to talk about uh, Stalin. We're going to talk about Cuba. What is the deal with Cuba? Why do I support Cuba? Why do a lot of leftists support Cuba, even though they are a dictatorial Marxist-Leninist regime from hell? We'll get into that next week. Uh, thanks uh, for coming on the show, Tony. I appreciate it, man. It's good talking to you. As always, James, peace. See you guys next week.